Enron was an energy company that seemed to be able to do no wrong. Their stock always seemed to rise, and their company motto was to ask, why? Well, with shady business practices and fraud, it's our turn to ask why. Hi, everyone. Thanks for stopping by our table of disappointment. This is How They Got Away, the show where we discuss the unsatisfying endings to your favorite unsolved or unpunished true crime and corporate greed stories. I'm your host today, Kelsey, with my co-host... Annalise, I am excited for some corporate greed. <laughs> uh, for those of us tuning in, we just did the Texas Killing Fields part one. So this is going to be a much more lighthearted episode <laughs> than that. For sure. Our table today is just kind of somebody's desk in on the third floor of the Enron office building. That's We're where we are. We're not in like a gray conference room? <laughs> no. And I'll tell it makes sense later. Uh, <laughs> that'll come back. There's people running around us. Everybody looks very busy. But no one's actually doing anything. That'll come back later. She tucks her, ha her hair behind her ear. <laughs> but no one's actually doing anything. <laughs> so we're going to start with the CEO of Enron, Kenneth Lay. He was a Baptist preacher's son, had a lot of jobs growing up, and from an early age had an idea that he wanted to make the world of business better. Very pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps kind of guy. Sure. He went to school and got a PhD in economics, and I mention this because he should theoretically know what he's doing. He's a doctor of economics. He's, yes, technically he's Dr. Lay. That's a funny name. Dr. L Dr. Oh, Lay. Nice. <laughs> he would. He sounds like a um, fraternity guy. I think he was in a fraternity, actually. Like, this is of the time where if you wanted to be in business, you were in a fraternity. It wasn't like a choice, really, if you wanted to make work. And actually, he had quite a few connections uh, in Washington. He, early into his career, was very into the deregulation of natural gas. So there's a lot of terms that I'm going to be throwing around for this that maybe the financial dubros among us are going to be like, oh, yes, of course. But if you're like me and you don't really know a lot about this world, some of these aren't going to make sense. So I've got a bunch of terms. Stop me if there's a term I don't follow up with a definition that you don't know what that means because there's a lot of funky words in here. But the deregulation, specifically as, as it relates to energy, means the restructuring of the existing energy market in an effort to prevent energy monopolies by increasing competition. So, you know, trying to avoid the big business of energy we do like that we do like competition we like taking down monopolies this all sounds good on paper it sounds like at the beginning at least there was there was a mission there was like an attempt to actually do something good here sure yeah and george bush senior yes now former president george bush senior helped secure billions in government subsidies for the deregulation while he was president. He helped Lay secure those funds and actually promoted Lay to work in the White House during his presidency. What did he do in the White House? Uh, kind of, a, I'm not really sure. He did this sort of like lobbying-ish position. He was kind of doing stuff with the financial aspect of the government. Sure. Because he like he wasn't a, in a voted office or anything, but I think he was yeah. involved in helping gather information, like p help push for this. Like a contract kind of, worker? Like, he might have been one of those people who like, because you know Congress doesn't actually write a lot of the stuff. He might have been helping no. write out the bills for Congress to look at, get the information together, things like that. Sure. So he has this moral character. He's like trying to do this selfless thing to make the world of business a better place. And while I do believe at least at the beginning there are very there's like a truth to that for him, it was also a character that he kind of played up to be this like champion of the free market. That's kind of what he saw himself as. And the free market for those who don't know, is an economic system based on supply and demand with little or no government control. So 
that's what he saw as the perfect world for business, at least in the United States. He wanted this freer market, break up monopolies. Government shouldn't be involved. Just, you know, release the reins and let us go. He was very much a capitalist. Yeah, I don't love, I love breaking up monopolies and increasing competition. I don't love entirely hands off of government because businesses can do a lot of shady shit. That's what I don't quite understand his logic on that is, is that he wants to break up monopolies, but then he wants to allow for the free market, which I, maybe he just hasn't played enough of the game monopoly to understand that I I feel like at least nowadays, a lot of people understand that the end goal of the free market is to create monopolies. Mm -hmm. Is that is that not correct? I feel like that's correct. But yeah, he wanted to liberate businessmen from rules and the regulations and the red tape of the government. Because remember, he wants to make the business world a better place for businessmen who work in business. He business. doesn't really... Business. It's not really about consumers, though is my point. Mm -hmm. So he does this ambitious takeover after he has completed his work at the White House. He does this ambitious takeover of Houston natural gas, which he quickly quickly merges with Internorth, which was a more of a, like a stock exchange kind of a company. So he's built this yeah, new company. Because merging is a great sign of not trying to form an office. That is my whole thing is that he's like, oh, I want to break up monopolies so that I can make my own monopoly. <laughs> Very silly to me. So new merger, new company name, months of branding research, you know, they put thought into the names that they give these companies, you know, it needs to be something that is easy to remember a household name, you know, comes to mind, just sounds nice. So they come up with Enteron. Because that really but like, rolls off the tongue. It really does. Uh, within, I believe it was minutes after Leia announces the new name, he was informed that Enteron is a word for the digestive tract. Hmm. Particularly the part portion of it that produces gas. Mm hmm. So when working in natural gas, that's not a great look. And it kind of is shocking to me that I don't know if they hired a marketing team for this or this was like an internal thing. But I mean, Google wasn't a huge thing at the time. This was the, the mid 1980s, but also like, come on, a quick pick up a dictionary. dictionary search to make sure it's not a word. No. So it became Enron instead, and Enron was born officially in 1985. Enron starts, and they're taking on these loans. But the thing is, if you deregulate natural gas, um, suddenly the supply goes way, way, way up because everybody's getting into the natural gas market. And thus, the demand kind of goes down because now there's all there's so many places people can get it from. So yeah. by the free market law, supply and demand, the price goes way, way, way down. So I've made this meme. I'm very proud of it. It's uh, deregulate natural gas. Supply goes way up and demand goes way down. Price for natural gas drops dramatically. Looks at it. Price for natural gas drops dramatically. Not really the business environment you want to come into when you're making a new company selling natural gas. That's not really yeah. a great hospitable environment for a new company. Not the ideal environment. No. And my thing with it is, is that this man has a PhD in economics. To get a PhD, you need to write a thesis. You need to defend this thesis. What you was need his thesis? To... I don't know. I really should have looked it up. That would. I am so curious to know. Dr. Lay, like, what was your thesis? <laughs> what was your thesis? Tell me though. But like, you need to know economics at least a little bit to get a doctorate. Yeah. And I feel like this was um, like maybe I don't. I'm not saying I would have seen it coming as a person in the middle of it, as a person who doesn't really know a whole lot about economics outside of like a layman's understanding. But if you have a doctorate, I feel like you should have seen this coming. Especially mm -hmm. since you caused it. The like writing push for it. Yeah, exactly. So that's 1995 Enron. They're like, oopsie doopsies. 
we got to make this work. So instead of, I don't know, trying to drum up business, trying to do something unique to draw customers your way versus everyone you else. Uh, immediate scandal within two years of this company's birth, which is known as the Valhalla scandal. So in 1987, two years after the company's founding, just keep it in sure. mind, uh, two traders and Enron Oil were caught basically misappropriating funds. So Enron Oil, what it does is that it trades in oil stocks. So in the stock market, they make bets on oil prices rising or falling. And then if you guess right, you collect on the sort of the difference based on what percentage of money you've put in. Yeah, some legal gambling. I, I do not understand that part of the stock market that we're all like, oh, yeah, you just legally gamble on the fate of the economy. And then you win or you lose. They always seem to guess right. And it was a little too good to be true. And experts were like, they're making too much money for them to be doing it legitimately. An anonymous tip would come in about Enron Oil's president, Louis Bourget. So he's president of the subsidiary, the company underneath Enron, sure. Enron Oil. Mr. Bourget, Enron Oil. Exactly. Allegedly, he had taken over $3 million of corporate funds and put it into his own personal account. Lining those pockets. That's embezzlement. I don't think I need to tell you that's embezzlement and that yeah. it's super illegal. Yeah. In addition to this, they also, through investiga internal investigation, found uh, offshore bank accounts and phony accounting books. And the reason for these was that they had been shifting profits. Mm -hmm. This is a thing that is a technique that is used by multinational corporations to pay less taxes than they really should by moving profits into a tax haven. A tax haven mm -hmm. being a country where taxes are levied at a very low rate. And by doing this, the corporation can underreport the value of their profits and pay little or no taxes on it. So Which is move, so sketchy. It's it's sketchy. They move a whole bunch of money to like Switzerland or wherever, and then they can say, oh, I only actually made X money because all the rest of the money is in Switzerland. And then they can pay like a very, very low rate on those tax, a tax for those money, those monies, and then only pay the United States or whatever country they're in taxes for a, a piece of the profits they actually made. Imagine if they added this to Monopoly. <laughs> you need to like, <laughs> I would like to move account. all of my money <laughs> to Switzerland. Oh my God. Upon even further investigation, they would find a money trail that led from Enron Oil's treasurer, Tom Mastroeni, to a quote-unquote Lebanon speculator, a Mr. M. Yas. M-Y-A-S-S. -S. A Mr. My Ass. The audacity. They'd only been doing this for like two years. The company is two years old. At most, they've been doing this for two years, and they are so confident that nobody will catch on to what they're doing that they are just like putting on books oh yes i spoke with mr m yas and you know we had a very great meeting and oh i need to charge the company card six million dollars for you know business expenses what my guy what you could have just put smith no right you could have put smith. no there's so many Smiths, but instead you say my ass. Dr. Lay and his company put down my ass. Well, Borget and Master Wenny put down my ass. But and under his company. He, under his company. What does Lay do about this? Let's find out. They get called to Enron HQ to answer for what the fuck they've been doing for the last two years. And even at this internal meeting with the head honchos of Enron, they still produce fake bank records before eventually getting caught again and admitting to moving company profits into personal accounts and shifting profits. So they like still tried to lie <laughs> even after they'd been caught. So they get caught twice. So you'd think Dr. Lay, champion of the free market, would be upset. No. And he would do something about this. No, he no, thought that the no, my ass thing was really funny. 
if it wasn't super illegal, it would be pretty funny. <laughs> the real reason Lei doesn't do anything is that Enron Oil is the only part of the entire company that is making money at this point. But Enron Oil wasn't actually making any money. They were just shifting their profits to make it look like they were. They were just kind of, oh, we, you know, we don't have to pay this yeah. many taxes. So we actually kind of turned a profit. But Except even you didn't, the you just lied. illusion of doing well helps them. The illusion of doing well will become Enron's hallmark. For sure. They weren't fired or punished, Borget or Mastroeni. They weren't even demoted. Yeah. Lay they were actually benefiting the company. Benefiting the company. Lay actually sent a telex, excuse me. Lay actually sent a telex, which is an early fax, to Borget telling him to, quote, please keep making us millions. Because, yeah. sure, they're like not making any real profits, any quote unquote real profits, but we are talking already in the millions. Yeah. So this encouraged them to gamble even more money in the stock market because they got away with it. Yeah. They got the stamp of approval from Dr. Lay. And they managed to, through this, gamble away all of Enron's reserves. Most companies have some kind of reserve in case, so they can make sure that they can pay their bills, keep the lights on, sure. things like that, even if they're not doing so well business-wise. All gone. Muckleroy, an executive within Enron, managed to bluff the market, which saved the company because this would have been enough to tank it. But it only saved if it only, for now. If only that he wasn't able to do that. If only. I'm sure he, I don't know how he felt about this because bluffing the market uh, is making large market orders, either buying or selling in the stock market. So buying or selling large amounts of stocks and then canceling before those orders are actually carried out. Mm -hmm. And the point of this is to trick the market into moving security prices and make the company seem more secure than they actually are. Obviously a company that's making these huge, huge orders would be doing very well. But you know, you actually secretly cancel those so you don't actually have to pay any money. So it just kind of seems that way. I wanna be clear, this is illegal now. At the time it was not. Interesting. Interest. I think that's more about when the stock market was created, they didn't realize people could use it like this. Mm -hmm. And now uh, with the Dodd-Frank Act signed in 2010, this is very illegal. You can't do this. So don't get any ideas. Don't get any ideas. But at the time, I want to be clear that Muckleroy didn't actually, it, he did something sketchy, but not illegal. So Lay was shocked and appalled at the behavior of Borget and Master Wenny. Oh my god, I did, I did not see this coming. <laughs> Good lord. But had been cc'd on all the reports warning about the trader's behavior. People had been within the company going, um, hey, this is bad. This, they're being very reckless. We're not going to be able to recover from this if we're not careful and hadn't done anything. No. And he's probably like, oh, but I get thousands of emails in a day and I can't possibly look at all of them. That's just so much to ask. So it would be at this point that Mastroeni and Borget would be charged with the embezzlement and the shifting of the profits and the whatnots. Yeah. Mastroeni would receive a suspended sentence, which is where actually you sort of get a sentence, but also sort of not. It's where a judge sentences a defendant to jail or prison time, but then delays imposing said sentence in order to let the defendant serve time on probation. And if you complete, it's like kind of reversing. You Sometimes people will go to jail and then probation. So they let them do the probation first. And if you do probation successfully and you don't get in any trouble, they'll dismiss the sentence and you don't actually have to go to jail. Sure. So it's basically like you be on your best behavior for X amount of time and then you don't have to go to jail. But if you do anything during that time, it's straight to jail to serve out the sentence. Yeah, because they don't consider him as a high of a risk. <laughs> I mean, white collar crime is so interesting. It's like, are you a danger to other people? Yeah. It's a question, I think. 
Borgette, the president, uh, was convicted for fraud and spent one year in jail. Okay. So that's all of the crime we've gotten so far. Again, though, we're only two years into the company's existence. So already we're looking at scams and fraud. So Richard Kinder, the one responsible guy on the executive board of Enron, was promoted to chief of staff after the Valhalla scandal. By the way, it was named the Valhalla scandal because it took place in Valhalla, New York, not oh. for any like sure. Viking heaven sort of a thing. Sure. <laughs> he was promoted to chief of staff to avoid future embarrassments. And in 1988, pretty much seized control of the company during a meeting that was called a quote come to jesus moment by <laughs> members who were there literally company has been alive for three years two of those years was huge scandal i personally believe that richard kinder walked in took enough time to understand how fucked this company was and then was like i'm the captain now if you want this company to survive i am in charge now and everyone went um uh, okay he, this I think he laid it out. He was like, we are yeah. this close to going under or people going to jail. We need to do this, 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 and this if we have a chance of keeping this company above water and people out of jail. And people were like, you know what? Okay. The one guy that knows what's going on. <laughs> Literally in my notes, it says Richard Kinder, the one responsible guy here. That's what it says as his title section. He begins cutting costs immediately and focuses so much on paying down the company's debt which is where their focus Good. really should have been yeah and within the first year he actually got the company to turn a profit which is incredible before they were just dollars. fucking around and finding out yeah they were taking on debt after debt and just like gambling away the reserves in the stock market essentially but he turned a one hundred and nine million dollar profit within the first year which i think is an incredible turnaround. And if they had just left him in charge, this company could still exist today and may actually be like- But of course they don't. But of course not. Because here's the thing about Kinder. He was kind of risk averse. My thing with this is that they he was only really in charge for a couple of years and sure he's risk averse. People went to jail. Yeah, there's a reason to be worried about risk right now, especially when the company was about to go under as you took over. Yeah. So like, I'm, what I'm saying is, who's to say if he would have changed his tune as the company became more secure and then was more in a position to take some risks. But Lay saw himself as this, he was still CEO, by the way, even though Kinder was functionally in charge. Lay saw himself as this revolutionary who would shape the future of the natural gas industry. And Kinder's kind of risk averse attitude after people went to jail and the company almost went under, it just, it wasn't his vibe. Dr. Lay has that PhD ego. He really, you know, I wonder if some of that is that because there are so many times where people are like telling him what's what and he's just choosing not to listen. And he goes, <clears throat> do you have a PhD in economics? I don't think so. I don't think so. Actually, one of my coworkers was in a building that Dr. Lay just happened to be having a meeting in. He was just sitting in a room, a conference room, just like doing something on a computer. And then somebody walked in and was like, Dr. Lay needs the room. And then like cleared the, like, the hall, at least, if not the floor. And then he passed him in the hall as he was leaving. Like, Man had some pretentious attitude for sure. Jeez. So now with his biggest money makers in jail, because they weren't actually making all that money, and Kinder being kind of a buzzkill, Lay needs fresh ideas. Because Lay needs all the excitement of gambling, but also wants to make the money and not get caught. So exactly. He's do some he wants all the good shit. parts of gambling. Not yet, but he is gonna. he's going to bring in someone who... has the same ego i must say beautiful great because that's exactly what we need two egomaniacs right now that's what this company needs so typical financial dude bro jeffrey skilling when applying to harvard business school was asked by a professor if he thought that he was smart his response was quote i'm fucking smart 
to I, like some fucking 18, 19 year old whelp. I can't. Yeah, just can't. sit with that for a second. Yeah, you've met this guy, even if you haven't realized you've met this guy. If you've met like the insufferable financial dude bro archetype, this is him. He invented that archetype. God, he is the blueprint. He is the blueprint. He began consulting for Enron and by the late 80s spent most of his time with them. And by 1990, now 36 year old Jeffrey Skilling came onto Enron as a full time employee. So you've been consulting for a while and then sure. fully joined the company. He kind of earned the moniker as the idea man. So one such idea was the gas bank. The idea was that it would reduce exposure to the inherently risky business of gas to for consumers. They would essentially take on the risk by having companies sign a contract to sell to Enron, and then customers would sign a contract to buy from Enron. So they made Enron a middleman. Less risk and more money for Enron. Sure. On its surface, not a bad idea. Yeah, a little capitalisty in a kind of, yeah, it's a gross kind of capitalistic way, but it's perfectly legal. And, but it did have a couple of unintended consequences. It, the concept of natural gas as a contract that could be traded so that you could trade these, you know, connective contracts kind of started here and skilling created the market and then made money exploiting it because he made it so he knew all the low calls already sure so he set up another subsidiary and run finance to do just that in 1991 again only a few years after the whole scandal thing Enron Finance merged with Enron Gas and Marketing to become Enron Capital and Trade Resources. So now they're kind of moving away from selling gas themselves to trading, buying and trading these contracts. Sure. And Skilling ran it, of course. And I bet nothing's going to be wrong with those contracts at all. No, of course not. Skilling, when he agreed to take on ECTR, Enron Capital and Trade Resources, he, one of his stipulations for joining was that he wanted them to use a method of accounting called mark to market accounting. What this is, is a method of measuring the fair value of accounts that can fluctuate over time, such as assets and liabilities. It's meant to give an accurate appraisal of a company's financial situation. When you work with something that the value of it will change as the years go on. Sure. So what this essentially means is that the entire value of a contract is put on the accounting books the day that it is signed, even if no money has actually changed hands yet. Okay. Which sounds sketchy, but is legal and is used in some situations. I'll get into that in a second. Sure. But has never been used in the gas, the natural gas industry. And the reason for that is because it requires accurately calculating the price of gas up to 20 years in the future, which is which essentially is, impossible in the natural yeah. gas industry, as we've seen with uh, oil prices going up and down like wildfire for the last couple of years. And I think, honestly, it's kind of hard to actually predict a lot of things 20 years out for the price. Exactly. So what this meant in reality is that Enron's profits were kind of whatever they said they were. Because they could just fudge it again. Exactly. Some other problems with that is that actual money was only coming in quarter to quarter. So cash on hand to pay the light bill, the electricity bill, pay for, you know, rent for offices, pay people's checks, things like that. Don't have a lot of that. And was a very different picture from what they were telling shareholders. So you're looking at people who don't really quite know where the money for the upkeep of the office is going to come this month and then turning around and telling the stakeholders that they're making millions. I just want to know the one like manager that was in these meetings is like, guys, okay, this is our budget. We have X amount of employees that we can pay X amount of money and this, this, and that. And they all go, yeah, but the business looks really good right now. 
<laughs> Honestly, that's what Kinder has been doing this whole time. He's going, what about this other part? <laughs> what? But doing this makes the company look like it's growing and it drives up the stock price, which means that the company's making money, but not really. It's very odd because you can buy stock prices in your own company. So you're on the individual level, people are making money and they actually yeah. encourage employees throughout this, even to the point where it's clear to the executives that shit's going to hit the fan. They were encouraging employees to buy stock in Enron. Of course. All the way up into the end. So Arthur Anderson and the SEC both approved the use of mark to market accounting. What this means, Arthur Anderson is a accounting firm that one of the firms that makes sure that, or they were one of the firms that makes sure that things are on the up and up when it comes to how companies are running. <clears throat> and the SEC is the US Securities and Exchange Commission. So they're basically making sure that everything is on the up and up, mostly with how it pertains to how the stock price of a company in the stock market is calculated. Sure. And they prove this, so they're letting Enron basically say they're making whatever they say they're making and driving up their own stock price. They got the government stamp of approval. <laughs> We're good. They do. From a guy who didn't want any government involvement in, in business. Honestly, yeah, exactly. So despite sounding hella sketchy, technically perfectly legal. And uh, some examples of companies that use mark-to-market accounting would be Bank of America or JP Morgan. They use mark-to-market accounting for things like long-standing accounts, like long-standing assets, like a house, a house's value in 20 years or something like that. Okay. But Enron is quote unquote growing. And in 1992, Enron was the largest merchant of natural gas in North America with a $520 million profit in 1995. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Quote unquote profit. <laughs> and they're growing fast because the next year by 1996, ECT alone was worth upwards of $650 million and was the second most profitable division in Enron. So the year before, they're making more than the entire company the year before, just ECT, and they're the second most profitable. They're not even the most profitable part of the company. Because they can just, they got the government sign off to just say that they make whatever. <laughs> It's literally that I have the paperwork right here and it's just a piece of paper that says I can do what I want with a government seal on it. So the company's good, looking very good right now. And sure, most of that is through idea guys like Skilling and other executives, but Lay is taking all the credit. Oh yeah, because he has the, the doctorate. He's Dr. Lay. He's Dr. Lay. He created this free market of natural gas, I'll have you know. He is the mentor of this guy over here that is doing everything for this company. I, as Dr. Lay, am his mentor. He got his everything mentor. from me. From me. Lay was far more interested in living the high life than in actually running a company. So this works of out. Of course. He was putting money into political campaigns. I think he was trying to recreate that relationship he had with Bush Sr. And he made Enron one of the biggest supporters of Bush Jr. when he ran for governor of Texas and then later president of the U.S. Clearly, bestie friends with the Bo the Bushes. Yeah. They're having brunch. They're, honestly, I think they probably had like a standing to get together. Four out of five of Lay's kids, because this guy has five kids. Damn. Work at Enron or a subsidiary of Enron, which doesn't scream because nepotism, nepotism at all. No, no, no. It's just because his children are so talented, especially that one son who worked at a company with ties to Enron who embezzled over a million dollars from them. Enron's business model was, for the most part, making bets with other providers on the price of energy in the future. So stock is everything. Stock is essentially the same thing. You're kind of making bets on 
where the economy will go, what the worth of the company is, things like that. Yeah, because the stock market and the economy are super stable things to stake your entire business on. Incredibly stable. No one has ever lost anything in the stock market, ever. No, there has never been a stock market crash. No. But like we learned with the Valhalla scandal, when they had to bluff the market to make it look like their company was more stable than it was, selling the idea of a stable company is almost more important than selling what you're selling. When it comes sure. to the stock market, 100% that is true. And Skilling didn't accurately calculate the business prospects for the next year when working with the SEC and trying to calculate stock price. What he did was looked at what earnings needed were needed to keep the stock price going up and then would just make employees meet that number, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Because that's just how we run things. Honestly, though, it is because that is such a microcosm of the larger issue of capitalism, which is that there is a need for constant growth. But eventually, that's just you cannot keep growing infinitely. Eventually, Everyone you will run will into plateau an issue. at some point. Not Enron, baby. Never Enron. Sure. No. Losses? That's a later problem, baby. We don't need to worry about that right now. And it's just like again with this mark to market accounting it's it's for how short-sighted skilling seems to be his choice of using mark to market accounting for this seems so futurist like long term because it has just helped him do sketchy shit to keep the company looking good years into the future because again there's this mark to market where we can say we made a deal that was worth 45 million dollars today when in reality i didn't even get cab fare for the way home mm -hmm. and these shady business practices were meant to be temporary always meant to be temporary until the company's next big idea that would earn them all the money that they needed to clear all their bad debts and skilling would you know come out on top again just like he did with his gas bank and we don't, you know, we don't need to do this forever, but it just kind of seemed to keep going. He's really banking on something coming up that will like help and like bolster them, but he's not doing anything to make that happen. Well, he, I mean, he is, he's creating a incredibly toxic work environment that he believes yes. will through competitiveness, create a, this big idea. Greed and he is called everything. This, greed is everything. And he called this idea, the big enchilada. Dude. I know. Dude, he's such a dude, bro. He's such a dude, bro. The first crack at this big enchilada was the deregulation of electricity. So just like they had done with natural gas, they wanted to do the same thing with electricity. Sure. And so thus Enron Energy Services was the department they created. They basically made the uh made the subsidiary, made the department before like it really had a purpose yet. They were so confident that they would need it. What they did was they, just like they had, that Dr. Lay had done previously with natural gas, they tried to push for the federal deregulation of electricity. And Enron thought that this electricity, if this electricity were deregulated, that customers would flock to them for, directly for their energy needs because they were already such an established energy company, even though they hadn't touched electricity before. Because at this point, they are still, like, a good reputation. Yes, they, people were, like, Enron has cracked it. En Enron's secret to success. Like, they were published in financial papers studying, like, how they had done so well. Nobody suspected anything. And Enron lobbied Congress because, once again, Dr. Lay has so many connections in the White House to pass a bill deregulating electricity in the states and they spent millions pushing this again millions that technically speaking they didn't have and in 1999 alone their lobbying budget was 37 million dollars jesus uh but for all of that and for all of their connections this didn't happen electricity stayed regulated with the exception of one state that embraced the free market by deregulating electricity, which was California. California. <laughs> California. To get into California's newly deregulated electricity, because Enron is, because Enron is uh, 
located in Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas Texas has like a really great they have a lot of natural gas, so it, it made the most sense to start and run there. But to get into California, Enron bought and merged with Portland General Energy, an electric company. So California, to make this free market happen, implemented several laws that were meant to embrace it. Enron immediately devoted a full-time staff to going over these laws with a fine-tooth comb to find vulnerabilities. Nothing about that screams sketchy to me. No, not at all. Enron learned that electrical transmission lines could become congested, which would drive up the price of electricity as the government would become desperate to purchase electricity from anyone in order to get electricity into homes. Basically, what this means is that so much electricity would be put into power lines that couldn't handle it, that no electricity ended up getting through. So it would look like an outage. Because that's a great way to keep customers happy. And there was no way to tell if this congestion reflected customer demand. Like, is everybody using up all this electricity that there's not enough? Or if the electric companies were manipulating the results, which Enron figured out pretty quickly. Hmm. Enron inflated projections of electric use so that Enron Electric would be paid to fix the congestion. It would go, oh, California, we can fix that. We've got all this power to spare. I mean, you know, we will demand uh, the high demand price for our electricity, but we'll get it to you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. They also sold reserve power that they didn't really have, assuming they'd never have to supply it. What that kind of means is that there's like a reserve energy for, you know, people who might really need power in a large outage like hospitals or government buildings. But Enron was like, ah. There won't ever be an issue. We'll never need oh, to Oh, there's never going to be an issue. It's not like we're putting Band-Aids on things already. Uh-huh. And they also hoarded electricity. Electricity is such an interesting thing because it seems like such a nebulous, non-physical thing. But it very much is, and you can hoard it, and you can move it around. And that is what Enron did. Whenever there was a surplus of power in California, Enron would export it out of the state by physically moving it through power lines. You can kind of send it where you want it to go from like the headquarters, driving sure. the price up because now supply and demand. Now there's low supply, so there's high demand. And then they would import it back into the state so it could be sold at the now inflated price. They learn, they know how to run a free market. At one point, they won a bid to supply Southern California with 2,900 megawatts of electricity during peak hours when most people need electricity. That's a pretty good price. Then it intentionally chose a line to transmit that energy that could only handle 15 megawatts at a time. Because we want to create a problem in order to solve the problem and profit. Exactly. Obviously, this line couldn't handle it, so it looked congested. The government would then scramble to find alternative power sources to the city. And the short notice would, me would mean that they would pay inflated prices. In this instance, Enron drove up the price of energy by 70%, costing users $7 million, approximately. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Average prices for electricity, because it, I mean, if you don't, electricity and megawatts and how much per megawatt is kind of weird. The price for electricity bumped from $24 per megawatt hour to 750 per megawatt hour. Jesus. So almost a 700% uh, hike. Jesus. And I'm sure nobody was really struggling during this time. I'm sure this didn't bankrupt anyone. No, California was completely fine. In the year 2000, there definitely were not 55 energy emergencies throughout the state. Jesus. In the year 2001, there were 70. So problems not going away. No. And rolling blackouts had to be implemented. Small businesses who couldn't operate without power had to close. They couldn't afford the uncertainty or the loss of product. Awful. A big business taking out little businesses for their own profit? Hmm. Mm, it's almost like it's a monopoly. And kids had to be sent home from school. They couldn't keep the kids in the school without power. It wasn't safe. 
interrupting children's learning the future of America. Future of America, we don't care. We don't care. We're Enron. Enron defended themselves to state oversight agencies because state oversight agencies were like, yo, what's going on? And they said they didn't do anything and that it was the system's fault. It's the sure. infrastructure, because we all know how bad America's infrastructure is. I mean, they're not wrong, but that's not the real issue here. I mean, I bet Enron's logic was like, well, if you think about it, if you make a system that we can exploit, then it really is the system's fault, isn't it? If we can find uh, loopholes, it's your fault. Your fault. In June of 2001, Federal Energy Regulatory Commissions set caps to energy prices, and that put a pretty effective end to Enron's market manipulation. Prices went down and the emergency stopped. But Enron made hundreds of millions of dollars doing this. Of course they did. And Californians had had a fuck enough of Enron. Lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. No lawsuits yet. But they were not able to keep their facade of this perfect, successful company, at least in this instance. Jeff Skilling denied culpability and told Businessweek that Californians should thank him for t trying to deregulate the market. The level of gaslighting, pun intended because this is a natural gas company, what the hell? <laughs> if that made you mad, Skilling made a joke at a conference in LA, Los Angeles, California, in the state. Quote, you know what the difference between the state of California and the Titanic, Titanic is? At least the lights were on when the Titanic went down. What a fucking dick. Also, like, it was not received well. Read no, the fucking room. No, I would hope not. Nope. But at the very least, you would think, oh, well, Enron doesn't have to use these shady business practices anymore because they made all this money and now they have paid off all their debts and can start being like a normal company. Yeah, because they totally no. don't have a history of constantly being like, oh, we're like kind of okay now. Let's not take more risks. Oh, no. No, whatever money Enron earned from its unsavory business practices and electricity was hemorrhaged back out again on big deals that turned out to be duds. They were always looking for a short-term big break, another big enchilada, and it was costing them big in the long run. But Enron worked to hide this fact. Because Dr. Lay wanted a risk taker and a risk taker he got. In 1998, Enron invited Wall Street analysts to come to the sixth floor and visit the EES department in Houston. I think I said our table was on the third floor, but I mean the sixth, because if you look, our table is in the corner here while the Wall Street analysts are walking through. So we are during this thing where people look like they're busy, but they're really not because they need to impress Wall exactly. Street. Exactly. And these Wall Street analysts saw dozens of employees bustling around on phone calls, typing away on keyboards, us in the corner, but you know, whatever all looking incredibly busy making Enron money. And then they left Enron very impressed, but it was all a lie. Skilling filled the sixth floor with employees with, uh, from other floors. Most didn't even work for the electric section of Enron and told them to look busy. Pictures were put on empty desks to make them look like people worked there. Secretaries pretended to be traders. We're in the corner looking busy, I guess, talking. It's a great way to make it look like the company is making money. And it's a great example of how the company itself really worked. All facade, all image, no substance. All performative. Also, just as like a fun conclusion to the big enchilada in California, Enron's interference with the California electric grid was so bad that they called on the governor to resign. I don't believe that he did, but then when re-election came up, he was not voted back in. And in fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger was voted government, hey. uh, governor of California. Literally a celebrity was like, I cannot possibly do any worse. <laughs> and I'm not a Californian. I cannot really speak for Arnold Schwarzenegger's governancy, but I haven't heard any complaints. Before we leave part one, I will give you one more big enchilada attempt that they tried. This one's in broadband. 
Great. So Skilling's because broadband's so good in America. So good. In spite of the fact that Skilling did not even know how to turn on a computer, his secretary had to come in and turn it on for him. He thought idiot. he could get it broadband. Dude, honestly, it's not even about being an idiot at that point. It's that it's about being so egotistical that it's below you to learn. Oh my god. He was attracted to the internet because Wall Street was right in the dot com boom at this time late 90s big stuff sure. internet startup stocks growing wildly and he wanted a piece of that and that's understandable he thought they could trade in broadband the same way they did natural gas or electricity really one idea apply it everywhere he fleshed out the new and run broadband department again making a huge department a massive and expensive undertaking but again believing that the department would be so successful it would pay for itself and they would need it immediately so you might as well get it started before we've even got the infrastructure in place to do the thing we want them to do they paired with blockbuster to make this happen and we all know how that turned out oh blockbuster some might make an argument that this was part of the reason blockbuster failed but I'm uh, not an economist. I won't make that claim. They took it Blockbuster down with them. They projected to the public that they had the technology in hand to create this broadband infrastructure. But in reality, they were struggling with it. Still, even though they made no money out of this deal and eventually had to call it, they put down $53 million in earnings thanks again to their mark-to-market accounting system. Which is going to go so well for them. It would be at this point that executives are working harder and harder to hide what is now literally billions of dollars in bad debt. And executives are starting to sell their stocks. They keep telling employees to invest in Enron and they keep projecting this image of a company that has maybe had a little bit of issue in California, but really wasn't them. It was the system. They are a successful company, and you would be wise to invest. Because the executives see the writing on the walls, but they want to keep the business The going. executives see the writing on the walls. And that's where we're going to lean off for part one, journey for part two, where if you thought it was already sketchy, it's going to get so much more sketchy as new chief financial officer Andy Festo tries to hide this billions in bad debt. It only goes downhill from here i'm ready for the downfall mm, mm, mm. it's unfortunate though because as that kind of last piece says it it's on the backs of the lower employees who it always is had no idea it always is and they have to work in these horrible like competitive no teamwork bad poor management positions but everyone outside of the company it's an awful work environment. Yeah, but everyone outside of the company is like, oh, you're so lucky to be working for such a successful company. Well, I, I will leave you today. Join us for part two. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye-bye.